In this video, we're gonna be interviewing a real stud in the cybersecurity space, and this is gonna shock you. It shocked me that I was able to even get him on this channel, but we are interviewing Nikhil Matal. That's right, the creator of Nishang. I interviewed him, uh, and I really appreciate him being willing to come onto this channel uh, for a nice conversation. We had a great time. So before we get started, make sure that you like and uh, subscribe. This was a really fun interview, and I really hope that you guys get a lot out of it. And that is all starting right Right now. All right, so for everybody that is brand new to information security and that may not be familiar with your work, do you mind kind of giving a brief introduction about yourself and about some of the awesome research that you've been doing? Hi everyone, I'm Nikhil Mittal. Uh, I've worked a lot on uh, on-prem Active Directory and Azure security. Uh, I've uh, released some open source tools. You can find me as Samrat Ashok on GitHub. So I maintain some open source toolkits that are useful for both red teams and penetration testers and blue teams. Uh, I've, I've been into information security industry for uh, more than 12 years now, but I've been doing it for pretty pretty long time. I mean, uh, I did some college, uh, typical teenage college stuff when I was in college. So that was like 20 years ago. So that is how I, I started in, uh, in, the, in the hacker field. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm focused a lot on researching, as I said, on uh, Microsoft technologies, on-prem, Azure, etc. I teach courses, trainings on that, both online, offline. And yeah, that's that's my professional side. That's awesome. And that's a really, really impressive record so far. I mean, 20 years is a long time. 12 years is a long time. Uh, and you've produced some absolutely fantastic tools. And, and one of those tools that I know a lot of people will probably recognize is Nishang. Uh, so I wanted to kind of ask, you know, what got you into that project? Uh, and, you know, what really what motivated you to make it? And how has it evolved over time? So I, I, I have another project called Cotillia. So that was a more of a human interface devices. So you plug it that device into a machine and it gets directed as a keyboard and it types out stuff for you. So I started to look into ways of improving or doing stuff easily from command line on Windows. That's how I got started in PowerShell back in 2012. And that's where I thought, okay, it's, in, in, uh, it's good for a human interface device, but even other than that, it, it's pretty nice. And at, at that time, PowerShell version two, there was absolutely no detection by any sort of countermeasure or, at all, or anything at all. So I got started with Nishang uh, due to that. That's awesome. That's cool. And it's, I mean, there's a couple of other tools that I've noticed that you've that you've been working on. And one of the other really cool tools that I really liked reading about was Deception or Deploy Deception uh, for Active Directory. Um, you know, kind of with both of these tools being made and and kind of. In, in wider distribution and use, I guess, you know, how, how have you noticed that red teaming methodology has adapted with these tools being used? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm uh, answering it correctly, so what deployed deception I, I saw was uh, a lot of deception vendors who would uh, or create decoy objects in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Active Directory environments that they were trying to protect. But it is pretty easy to spot those decoys because something as simple as the security identifier, the SID of the, of the decoy object would not match the domain because it has injected later on. So I thought, okay, why not simply create some actual objects that, are, uh, that look real because they are real uh, and just turn on verbose logging on them. So even if someone simply runs, let's say, that user on that particular decoy object, the decoy user object, there is a 4662 of very verbose logging turned on direct service access so that we can detect even the uh, uh, the enumeration phase, et cetera. That is someone without having a need to actually interact other than the enumeration part. So that's that's how I came to note that. Interesting. Have you noticed that, it's, that a lot of organizations have adopted deploy deception to kind of, you know, I guess, full red teamers and, and adversaries that might be trying to enumerate an environment? I've not got many questions, but I know that some of the organizations do, some of the bigger ones do use that or something on uh, based on it. Uh, but I think that because of the lack of, uh, unfortunately, uh, blinking lights on it, no, 
and no GUI et cetera that shows some nice charts. Uh, the adoption is, let's say, is not wide as, let's say, uh, Nishang or even Cotillier, the project I do not maintain anymore. So, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it was, it is more of a POC. So at that level, yes, I'm happy with the traction it got. That's awesome. I mean, uh, even just like as a proof of concept, that's a pretty cool proof of concept. Man, I feel like that'd be kind of fun to play around with in a lab. <laughs> For sure. Do you, do you kind of play around with these in a lab just on your free time or, you know, are you just kind of focusing on some of the newer projects? Uh, I do. I do. I mean, it's so because I, I run my own company now, a small shop. So a lot of time goes into running the business as well. Uh, but yes, I do. I mean, that's that is something that I really want to explore. Uh, anything that new, anything new that comes up, if I can, let's say, detect or create, create something that, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I like keep updating my projects. That's, that's the gist. That's awesome. I noticed one of the things you mentioned about deploy deception, you know, is like the GUI or blinking lights, you know, aspect to it. You know, have you ever thought about, you know, creating a GUI or kind of opening it up? I guess it, it is open source, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Have you gotten like any, anybody interested in building out a GUI for that? So it could be, I guess, more attractive, you know, for kind of the non-technical people just to see the, the GUI there? You know, uh, what I've been uh, approached by our, uh, the, the organizations, the companies who actually create these uh, enterprise grade uh, deception tools. So uh, I've helped in developing a couple of them. I mean, some new concepts or things based on, uh, let's say, deployed deception. But unfortunately, no one has approached me yet to uh, contribute to the open source. I would be glad if someone does. Well, hopefully, you know, someone watching this interview is like, oh, that sounds like an awesome project I'd love to do. So, you know, oh, yes. fingers <laughs> crossed on that one. I feel like that would be a pretty cool thing to kind of see, you know, more out uh, just from a blue team perspective. I feel like just kind of messing with attackers, you know. Like giving them multiple, I mean, real objects, as you said, that, that appear real that are not, it's like, you know, almost like a little honeypot, like not quite as built out as a honeypot, but definitely a good way to detect, you know, someone snooping around where they shouldn't be. Uh, one of the things that I also wanted, I mean, you mentioned 20 years total that you've been kind of, you know, in and around the industry and then 12 that you've been kind of, uh, you know, working as a cybersecurity researcher. I mean, with, with how quickly cybersecurity evolves, it has to have evolved pretty tremendously over that time. You know, what are some big ways that you've noticed that cybersecurity has, has evolved? One uh, very interesting thing is, of course, the, the movement of everything to the cloud. That has been phenomenal. I mean, every, so uh, when I professionally started, uh, I, I used to, a decade ago, I used to work for one of the big folks. So if I compare, the penetration tests and red team operations at that time to today. So one thing that stands out, other than of course the improved level of security and the skills that are uh, required is a lot of things are on the cloud right now. Services would you, uh, which we, you would never even think of putting on online or approachable are, are now exposed to the internet. Of course, and that means that if there is a misconfiguration, something that was never supposed to be online is there. So that has been dramatic. And recently I've been into touch with some startups. Those, uh, I, uh, they, 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 they call themselves the cloud native startup. So there is absolutely everything that is online. So that has been great to see. And uh, interesting, I mean, uh, if, if, uh, to, to be honest, I'm surprised that not every one of them or most of them are hacked because uh, the cloud has now a problem of inventory management, no one knows what they have put online, unfortunately. So that, that has been the most drastic thing that I've seen, I think. How, how do you think, I mean, obviously the, the attack surface for companies is gonna change pretty dramatically if they move to the cloud. But would you say that overall that, well, I feel like this can kind of go two directions on this question. You know, is this a good thing or is that a bad thing? I know that a lot of, you know, business leaders are probably thinking, you know, should we move to the cloud? And the business benefits are pretty tremendous, right? But the security implications, you know, it can kind of go both ways. So, you know, if you were to talk with a, a business leader considering a move to the cloud, you know, what are probably a couple things that, or, or maybe even three things that they should keep in mind on that? Uh, the first and foremost, I would say, is to understand that 
uh, the cloud is, as, as all the cloud vendors say, it is still a shared security responsibility. So just moving something, and that is a big misconception where some of the, uh, like, like uh, our AWS, Azure, or GCP, all of them are responsible for that. The cloud is not secure by default. That's a big misconception, right? If you deploy something on the cloud, that is the, the, the biggest benefit of moving anything to the cloud is scalability and not security. So it, it is scalable, but is it secure? So that's a shared responsibility. If you know that what you are doing uh, if you know your assets, if you know what you are going to expose, then of course, there are so many better and updated controls on cloud compared to let's say the on-prem infra. So move to it if you know what you're doing and you share the responsibility of security. Yeah, I think the, the share responsibility is, I mean, just like you said, I mean, it's so much more important with the cloud as opposed to on-prem. There's still like the shared responsibility just internet wide as a, as a user, as an individual user, like, you know, if my account gets breached, uh, you know, that might give an attacker the ability to gain access to other people's information. So, uh, but in the cloud, like you said, now it's not only on a user level, it's at an enterprise level. That's frightening in some, <laughs> in some ways. Uh, what are some of the consistent threads over the past, you know, 12, 20 years that you've noticed in cybersecurity that may never go away? Phishing, for example, for initial access. So that and unnecessary privileges or i mean even i mean no uh, nothing against the the certifications the business security certifications but even those teach that need to know basis so these two th things the phishing or the thing where users are tricked and then unnecessary privileges i mean so many for example if you talk about azure if you let's say contrast on prem active directory in azure you would have unnecessary domain admins in on prem and then when you see an Azure environment, you would see, okay, here it would not, it should not be the same, but there you would have unnecessary global admins. So these two things have always been there. And unfortunately, I don't see it going away soon. Yeah, and I, I feel like that kind of ties into just general like user education on the phishing side, and then also, you know, discipline on the network admin side, right? Um, for, I guess we can kind of pick this apart a couple ways for like the, the user education piece when it comes to phishing. I, there are so many different ways that people can get fished and like the really good phishing, like it's almost undetectable. Uh, like, you know, a lot of like security people can even get got by it. So what are some, I guess, more general tips for, for the end user and I guess even some security professionals on, you know, what, what are some good anti-phishing tactics? Now that's, that's really hard to list up because if you, to be honest, if you ask me whose problem is that, is, is it the user problem that people are getting phished or is it the technology problem? I would say that's a technology problem, right? For example, a very simple example, although very stupid to bypass, very easy to bypass. Let's take an example of AVs, for example. Even a very simple basic antivirus would stop you usually from running, let's say, unknown malware. Uh, that works for phishing as well, but not to as to an extent, let's say, as you plug in a USB drive, a thumb drive, and there is a malware there, and you probably download a zipped version of that from the internet. So at least the zip would not be detected. So uh, I would say that we have unfortunately failed more on the technology side of it. Phishing is not such a hard problem to solve from the technology side. Because users, in any case, they have to open attachments. They have to click on links, right? And uh, one more thing that I have noticed a lot is the, the big tech, let's say Google or Microsoft or, or AWS. If you look at the emails that they send to their users and all of their users are IT guys, I mean, IT security or IT, their emails are terrible, really terrible. For example, uh, there was a recent notification that Google Drive sent to all Google Workspace users. Oh my God, that was a classic phishing uh, template right there. And it was a legit one, right? Uh, I mean, if, if you just, probably you, you got it, got that as well. If you have a Google Workspace, that, that was a terrible email to send to, the, to, to your users. So that is where the tech has realized, I would say. Users, there is a limit way, uh, to educate users. They are ultimately, you cannot, uh, 
teach your finance guy to be as prudent in opening attachments as let's say your IT security guys. Just as it is, it is not the it is the other way around. Uh, same as same as the other way around. You cannot teach your IT security guy to be as prudent in their finances as as your finance guys. So at one level, we have to stop focusing on users and we have to start focusing on another good example. I, I can speak about it all day. Another good example is let's say encrypted emails, right? Even today, let's say if you're using Thunderbird, you would be what using what GNP, right? I mean, there is no good encrypted email uh, if, you are, if you're using a mail client. So I would say if we focus on tech, then probably we can solve it if we keep focusing on users. I don't think so this is going anywhere. <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't even think about the technology piece there. And I feel like this is one of those interesting directions that maybe the cloud could be a, a tremendous asset. Uh, you know, I know you mentioned shared responsibility for security, but one of the nice things is sh shared knowledge. Um, and I feel like AI is just kind of, it, it's a vague, it's, it's kind of like a buzzword, but like just the machine element learning or the, the machine, the machine learning element, excuse me, of that and kind of getting just a ton of emails and kind of identifying what's phishing and what's not phishing. Maybe that could be a pretty good asset in identifying even like pretty good phishing emails. But like you said, you know, the, the, the false positives and false negatives issue with even how Google and, you know, other main vendors give their emails, it might require a bit of a step up, like you said. Correct. <laughs> They're accidentally phishing their own user base. <laughs> We're not even thinking about it. Um, and then kind of on just the, the, the big picture, you know, historical look at cybersecurity, what are some of the areas that you consider to be strengths that we've been able to maintain or that we have developed over time? So one thing that I could see is uh, one very good thing that I, I can see is uh, we could hold on is, uh, I mean, there is a lot of discrimination, et cetera. But if I see this industry, if I compare this to let's say other other as, for example, as as a person of uh, color, I could see that this industry is very very friendly. A lot more compared to I mean, of course, there would always be discrimination everywhere. That's that's a basic human tendency. But this industry has been so welcoming. I've seen people rise from nowhere to right to the top. Right, someone like me. I mean. I'm from a small town in India and, and I could, I've traveled across the world. I've been welcomed almost everywhere. There, of course, there have been instances, but I've been welcomed everywhere. I've, I've talked to so many persons and I've really seen any discrimination or someone talking down to me just because I'm a person of color, for example. So that has been a very good thing. Or the, there has been a lot of commercialization, but the hacker brotherhood or sisterhood or, or whatever the word you would like to use, that the industry has still hold on dearly a lot. I mean, it's it's been waning away a bit. There's been a lot of commercialization, or, uh, but it's still there, and that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. That and I'm, I feel like of all the of all the strengths that an industry could have, that's got to be probably the best strength <laughs> to be able to have and and maintain. Uh, on the commercialization piece, that's an interesting you know observation. I feel like it's been the past couple of years have been kind of tough with COVID kind of looking at like Black Hat and DEF CON and seeing how commercialized they may have become over time. Um, and then also, I feel like every time, every other time there's a breach, you know, you see vendors just kind of come out of the woodwork, you know, ready to, this is our product, this is the time. Uh, but yeah, I feel you on that one. That's, that's, those are some good observations. That's great. Uh, w one of the other things kind of going back to the open source nature of some of your work, you know, there's GitHub, right? Which is a fantastic platform and resource to use. It's been a topic lately, at least on, you know, InfoSec Twitter <laughs> is the, that GitHub has kind of had some issues with cybersecurity proof of concept work. Uh, some people have posted things like CVEs on, on GitHub trying to kind of explore different concepts and disclose vulnerabilities and they've had that removed. Um, you know, do you see this as an issue going forward or maybe as just a, a false positive or 
you know, I know that in some cases, Microsoft has kind of made statements saying that they're not looking for proof of concepts to be posted get on GitHub. I can kind of understand why they would want to to kind of go that route, but I can also see, you know, the the, the, the controversy with the InfoSec community on that. I would say that was expected the day they bought GitHub. I mean, the Microsoft, Microsoft has changed a lot, but I always joke that it is a tyrant cop, right? So, <laughs> So uh, big, the big tech is not going to cooperate with open source at all. I mean, that was, that's very clear. I mean, too much to expect from any of the big companies, right? They have, the, we are not, I mean, open source community is really a stakeholder. It is, but it's not considered. I, I, I don't think that there would be, let's say, any director on Microsoft's board that would represent the open source community. I don't think so. If, if there is one, I mean, I'm, a, I'm unaware of that. If there is one, then that is very good. So that was, and open source, that too, who is supporting, let's say, uh, posting POCs against Microsoft's own products, that's really too much to expect, to be honest. So that was bound to happen. And I would say, yeah, that's, that is something that we have to live with it, live with. And absolutely no vendor would, I'm, I'm, if you ask me as if I was Microsoft, even I would think second, okay, should I, should I allow this or not? Would my customers be okay with that? So any of the, the, uh, the big tech companies are, I don't think so anyone is going to allow that. That's, that's too much to expect, I think. I agree. I mean, the, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment on like, what if they did keep it up? But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I could see if I like if I were just to put myself in the shoes of like the CISO at Microsoft, I'd be like, eh, that's gone. <laughs> that's deleted. Um, what about like GitHub alternatives for cybersecurity researchers to kind of put these CVs? I know that I mean, GitHub is so established at this point, And it's just I mean, it's like shorthand, like I'll upload this to GitHub. It's like a project. Um you know, do you know of any good alternatives that cybersecurity researchers can leverage? I mean, well, what I personally do is I do post stuff on GitHub. And let's run your own Git server, run a GitLab. And if, if your stuff is taken down, I mean, keep a backup. And then not on GitHub, of course. So keep a backup, run your own Git server, use GitLab and put it there. Yeah, that's a good practice. Back up, backing up is a great practice, not just for that. Ransomware is a topic. Backups are a good thing for that too, right? right.